was featured to stand up and then I'll call you up one by one to start the panel. So um, if you are featured in the film, go ahead and stand up. Watch 
talking for you. I can't even see where Linda is. Okay. And make sure you talk into the microphone just because there's so many people here. We want to make sure everyone can hear. It's a good crowd. That's right. A good crowd. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Is this off? Um, <clears throat> thank you. This was an excellent film, and I'm quite impressed. My question is that <clears throat> there's a belief uh, that some people have, and probably the further north in Fresno you go, the more people have this belief, that many of the people you see on the street corners with these cardboard signs, really, you know, it's, it's a scam. They're collecting money and then they get into their car and drive home. Um, I'm not saying that I believe that, but I've heard this. And I would like to know from you folks, what, what is your response to that? I was um, asked at one time if I would like to come on board and because I'd be great at sitting on the corner because of my age with a sign and I'd make a lot of money. And I turned it down just for that fact because it was someone trying to get money, trying to deal with it. And I wouldn't give anybody on the corner like that money myself. <coughs> I have been out there. Does anybody else have a different response? Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree for the most part. Um, I was. When I was 17, I was on the streets in Santa Cruz. And um, though it was honest, I did make about $300 a day. But this was 10 years ago. But I have heard that some of them are not really homeless people that are on the street corners. Um, even now, even though I've been through homelessness, I still, this lady asked me for money for the bus, so I gave her a bus pass. And she said, well, do you have some money for some food? And I gave her a granola bar. <laughs> and she's still sitting there kind of like, you know, where's the money? But I won't do that nowadays. Um, I think the best thing to do if you want to help someone that's out there is ask them what you need. And a lot of times it's socks and foot powder. Toilet paper. Uh, toilet paper. <laughs> um, Water. Yeah. Um, hydrating stuff and food. Most of the time that's what they need. Um, I have something to say about that also. Um, in my addiction, I, I never um, had the the cojones to panhandle. You know, I did, I chose other endeavors. To um, and I I look at the people that are bold enough to panhandle, and some of them are faking it to make it, and then there's others that you know they really do panhandle because. Pretty much their life depends on the next train to survive. You know, um, I know a few that I, I've seen him shaking in the morning uh, from being sick, and he needed, he couldn't even get up, so he could kind of to get that drink. And my heart, my heart just went out to him, so, you know, I gave him a beer. Um, do I condone it? No. I, I say because I have been homeless that I prefer a hand up than a hand up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I got something. Excuse me. I got something to say about that. Um, I never, I never, so I've been on the streets, I never panhandled. I always, the way I got my stuff, my money or my, uh, my, my, my next, my next shot up or something that I, I street brought a lot, man. I um, I was a short young man out there, so a lot of people always looked at me like I was easy target, you know. There's a, um, so I, I had the street fall, I had street fight a lot. I lost a lot, I lost, I won a lot. But the thing about it was, what the point I'm trying to get is that not the thing is that <coughs> the the thing about it about the street pedaling thing is that. Not all people, everybody, everybody predicts that every, homeless people want to get money to drink and stuff and not, not a lot of people, not a lot of them do that, you know, a lot of them, there is some, 
a good majority of homeless people out there, they, they stay sober all lot, you know what I mean? They, they stay sober, so um, sometimes they get rejected because from people to get getting money is because they think they're gonna go spend it on the lit or they're gonna go spend it on the next shot up or they're gonna go spend it on the next rock we can get, you know? But it's in reality, oh man, the people are so quick to judge another person before they even like, you know, before they even ask, 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 you know, what they need it for. Yeah, some people will lie and be a hypocrite on it. Some people will just go to say to get the money to go get it. But you gotta actually look at the person's eyes before you actually think, you know, like, this dude's gonna get the other lip. Nah, he's, she or he's not really gonna do that if you really think about it. I'm gonna ask um, if my or Steve wanna answer that. When we interviewed you guys, you um, told, told us that you um, had lived on the streets in the tower before the Dakota Eco Garden. And it really surprised me when you shared that you lived in the tower and never knew about the resources that were downtown by the Colorado House. And so as, as someone like me who, like, I, I would assume, like, people, whether or not they choose to stay there, I, I would always have assumed that they know that those resources are there. So did you guys um, have any different answer to that question as far as how you made it without knowing about the other materials um, the out there? Well, the way we survived was we kept cans. That's how we make our money. We never pay for our cash, not even a penny. Um, but there will be people walking by you who will give you money, you know, even though you don't ask for it. You know, they'll, they'll give me, because uh, I have dog food, they'll give me money, they'll give me my dog food. And, you know, I, I'm just surprised that my husband will pick up cans and give me money. <laughs> okay, we got points on the last topic that we're talking about. Um, I want to touch on her talking about someone's next beer because I don't know how, I, if this is a widely known fact, but um, you can die from alcohol withdrawal. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, another thing is, this girl stayed clean on the streets for a very long time by herself. So there are people, it's not. Yeah. Um, another thing is, not, not all homeless people are addicts. Um, you have to want it because there was there was many years that yeah. I would wake up with a beer in my hand for the first time. Yeah. So and, um, <laughs> and about the Pavarello house and stuff that you asked about, um, I didn't know about that stuff either. I was homeless for a year in Clovis because I was from Clovis, and there's nothing there, no resources out there. I starved so many times, crying that I was starving. And you didn't know about the I had no idea. Wow. Um, the, about six months in or so, maybe six or seven months in, after just struggling, starving, and nowhere to sleep, I'd sleep on um, church doorsteps, freezing cold, um, until I found um, on Dakota and Cedar, I think it's St. James, that um, two hot meals a week and two showers a week that you got from there, and that's, that's the only thing I need for, for more than a year before, before I ended up in Fresno and found out all about. I would like to get a good point on that also because I had so close to my, my homeless um, when I became homeless the first time I was, like, Whoa. <laughs> 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 um, was in 2003 and I say October 2003 and um, I slept in my neighborhood you know um, at on the grass um, by the Oaxaca barbershop on the grass um, you know uh, on the bus the bus be benches. Um, I had no clue that the public revolution movement existed um, until um, a, a church, a church ministry, used to come out and pray for me on Saturdays, and, and um, they're the ones that dropped me off at um, the Daomi House. Maybe. And they, they don't even take people at night, but it was God sent. Um, they allowed me to go. It was, it was in the evening, and so. You know, I had no clue that you can go over there and shower and wash your head clothes and, and you know, they play bingo. I had, I had, I had no clue. Mm -hmm. It did make things a lot easier. And Clovis was also hard because the, the cops, I mean, I was at a church one day getting food and clothes at a church and the magic team that deals with games approached me and my boyfriend and said, we're, 
We're finding all the transients, homeless people, to find out where they're living. And I looked at him like, where do you want an address? I'm homeless. We're looking for homeless people to try to find out where they're living. Four or 12 years later. They harass a lot of people. Okay. Just don't know. It's on my ID for 12 years All right, who else has a question? Okay, go ahead. Having this. My name is Vanessa Greer and I provide complex, comprehensive care to homeless veterans with the President of VA. And they keep working this on. And um, one thing that the, the panel has brought to our attention, and I think the communities don't understand this, is that when you are homeless, you don't think very well. You are dehydrated most of the time, Surviving. and food securities is a big issue. And so um, that's why in my office, as soon as we, I get a homeless veteran in, Immediately, I get the water, grow all of ours. If they need soup, we get that out. And these are the things that they need. And this is what, I mean, if, if everybody in this room really wants to help the homeless, here, our VA was, I guess, fortunate or unfortunate enough to be the 25th, we're the 25th city in the country to have homeless veterans. And so our program has ramped up, and we have housed many, many veterans, and we have very busy year this year, but if you want to help anybody that's homeless out there, keep in your car food and water and a hygiene kit yeah. and a pair of yes. socks. I mean, it's easy. Mm -hmm. I get t-shirts, underwear, socks, <laughs>
you know, we talked about the services that are available, and this lady talked about the, the VA, which is great. But I want to ask you, you, you mentioned that you don't know about, or you didn't necessarily know about the services, and, and that for us is really important, because that's what we're in the business of doing, is connecting people with the information. What do you think we should be doing to try and help educate those of you that are in your situation so that you know about the Pomerello House and all of these other resources? I'd really like to get some sense from you on that. It's hard nowadays because homeless people are scared right now. <laughs> They've been bullied by the Fresno Police Department and our mayor, and they're running scared, and they're afraid to come up to the average citizen and ask for any help, or especially social services, or, or any county or, or statewide connection. They're afraid. And they're not as easy to get to anymore because they're not, not trusted. There's no encampments. So and they're here. Like, and they're hiding. <laughs> they're, the, they're really hard to find the help or give information to because they're hiding. The people in our encampment, I have seen one of those people since. And there were nine elderly people in that encampment. And I don't know if they made it through last winter. I, I haven't seen hide or hair of them since. They're so spread out and, and gone. And uh, I knew about the Evangel home and I knew about uh, Naomi house. And I was 61 at the time. And <coughs> being home, there's no way I could stand in line from four until they let us in and be the 26th person in line and you're out of luck. They have 25 beds, you're just out of luck. They have no place to put your car, no place to put your bike. And I couldn't take my little cat with me. You know, and a lot of times animals are your, your only thing to love and to love you back. And that's why I didn't go to the Naomi house when the officer suggested it to me at 12 o'clock midnight with the flashlight in my eyes. And how old are you? I'm 61. He goes, well, my mom's 65 and she's working. And I said, well, good for her. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I have health issues and, and I'm here. <laughs> and it's, it's just the way that, that people treat homeless people. We're still people. Just, I worked hard all my life in this town. the lack of two paychecks to put me in the street. And I, I always had my own home, always had my cars, always had groceries. And then I had nothing but my bicycle, my cat, and my backpack. And uh, it's mighty cold. And if it hadn't been for cinnamon, I probably would have uh, faded that, that one dream. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to say something. Um, when you don't know um, that there are services out there, um, and then you know you become too know. Like when I found out in 2007, um, I was in my addiction, and the minute something went wrong, you know I put up a wall, and I didn't allow anybody to help me. And it's very difficult when you're in that state of mind um, when you feel that. There's no hope. Now, uh, as she was talking, I was thinking, you know, I, I wrote, I posted on Facebook that the people that I love weren't gonna be here today. And it, it made me sad, but then I sit here and I look around, and the people that I do love are here today. You know, I have one of my anger management guys over here, and I got my navigator, and there's Nancy Waybo, and there's Jerry Bill, and so much and if I once I let my guard down and I allow people to love me and to help me that begin the process of healing and so I'm just I just want to thank you guys for being a part of my life and not giving up on me
Holly? <laughs> Patty. Patty. I'm asking for understanding, help me understand. You brought up drugs, and so some people that are homeless do have drug problems. Yes. Knowing that world, it's like you're ready when you're ready, and there's not a lot you can do to make a person be ready. So in my mind, that group of homeless people, I just don't know, I don't know. I was in my addiction before I even became homeless. Um, you know, I was a functioning dysfunctional addict. You know, I, I started using from the age of 10. You know, I grew up in a dysfunctional home. I grew up in foster care. I didn't know what it was like to have a sober day in my life. You know, um, until one day after the encampments got torn down and I actually was walking around the pub for three days, lost, literally lost. And I knew exactly where I was at, but I never felt so homeless and so you know, by myself, and so hopeless in my life until that very moment. And and there was a there was a set of people that came out and um, were giving out a bottle of water and you know reading material and you know socks. <laughs> and she asked me if I needed prayer, and I said yes. You know, and she asked me for specifics, and I told her, you know, I'm tired of people kicking me when I'm down. She said, why would they do anything less than what you're already doing to yourself? And that day I stopped using. Because I know it has to come from me. If I really want change, I need to, I need to make it happen. You know, and I have 19 months clean. You know? And even though I still get depressed and I still get down. There's just no way. But it, it, there has to come a point in a person's life when they want better for themselves. The sad thing is, okay, for people who have drug and alcohol problems and people yeah. who have mental health problems, there are resources for it. It's the ones that don't have those things that it's hard, that they don't have help. You know what I'm saying? Um, it all, I guess the best you can do is give them information. Say that, you know, there, there, there's this organization that can help you or that organization that can help you. What they do with that information is on them. Um, but there are resources that help both of those. It's the ones that don't have any. Um, and I do know quite a few homeless that are, that are not mentally ill and don't have um, drug problems. You know, a spouse can die. And you know, I know someone like that, their spouse died and they just ended up on the street. So give information, food, water. Yeah. That's my question. I was an addict and I was in an alcoholic. And I was on the street. And some use to cope with being on the street. Like they they, they end up homeless. The people they do friend maybe are, you know, have this stuff and it's gonna help them feel better and cope with being on the street better. Um, and selling it will make them some money. And boredom. That can happen too, you know. It can happen where they end up homeless for another reason, but end up using that to cope. But um, yeah, the best thing you can do is research. There, there's a lot of, um, not a lot, you know, for, for the amount of problem we have, there's not enough resources, but if you research, you know, mental health organizations and um, drug and alcohol organizations, and, and have that information on hand that we can help. Okay, so we have her and then him, and I saw Nancy to the right. Okay. Hi. Um, my name's Gail, and um, I'm currently staying at Naomi's house uh, by the grace of God. Um, I do want to say that the Carl house and the Naomi's house is a safe place for women. Um, we have a big screen TV down there. We have all our needs met. We have three, three square meals a day through the Pavarello House. Uh, we have a, a warehouse full of clothes. We have uh, staff that are unconditional. Uh, 
It is a very safe place, even though it's down on F Street, which is about 10 miles from F Street to, to Clovis. Um, I find um, that uh, I'm also 17 years sober. Uh, I'm currently, I'm currently uh, in a 12-step program because of the unmanageability of my homelessness. Uh, it does bring on a sense of uh, insanity at a certain point in your life, which can trigger a mental illness. Um, would you not agree with that? Yes. 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 Um, we have a medical and a dental clinic there. Um, <clears throat> problems that that arise are things such as not having proper identification, like a driver's license. It costs thirty-seven dollars to get a driver's license. You cannot look for an apartment without one. Um, bus passes. It's a long ways to go. There's one bus, 34, that goes in front of the Pavarello house. And um, I currently have a job, a part-time job, with two paychecks away from getting my own apartment. <laughs> with, with that said, there is um, there's housing uh, staff that will help you find somewhere, but it takes a long time to get on the list, get your proper identification in order, which costs money. Uh, sometimes I can recycle $2.50 a day. Um, so, you know, we get a little frustrated and we want to quit. Uh, I, like I said, I, I, I currently work a 12-step program. I do have a sponsor. One thing about Carverella House, we do have AA meetings there, but there's not enough sponsorship there. It just covers the first three steps. Mm -hmm. There's an unmanageability. So um, I just want to say thank you for this film. It was, it was excellently done. I appreciate everyone here. Thank you. Two that you said were ready. Yeah, and, this, and this gentleman, and then we have someone over there raising his hand. And I did see a hand over here. Okay, we're gonna after those three, we're gonna wind down because I want to leave time for people to talk one on one with anyone who's here that they have connected with or that they want to follow up with. So go ahead and take it in the order that you said that. Yeah, <coughs> my name is Frederick. I happen to catch. The, the interview you did with KDP, KDPR the other night, and you brought out that you originally came up, came to this whole concept by encountering someone in the library who you didn't really know was homeless, and you later found out they were homeless. But once you found out, you said, "I never, you know, I never would have looked at them in the way I did." Previously, as a library patron, you know, once I found out they were homeless. I, I say that to ask you, number one, is that person who was in the library among the six people up there? But if not, m my idea for the idea board is just like there's the 0.22% library tax that was put together, and the Measure Z tax for the zoo, I mean, if animals aren't homeless, why should people be? I mean, that's, 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 the point is, there's enough goodwill in, in, a, in, a, in a county the size of Fresno, which I think is close to a million, if I'm not mistaken, where a point, a 0.15, a one three tax to you know build up either land or whatever or uh, you know more Pavarello houses, more Naomi houses, or a jobs program. It, it, it's like a no brainer. You know, and I, I do want to emphasize anyone else that has ideas like that, I really do mean it 
put them up there and we will make sure that they get documented. Thanks, Linda. My name is Geraldo Kamara, and I am homeless, right? And I utilize the resources that social service has. Immediately, they gave me food stamps, like almost $300 worth. But as far as cash aid, you have to go out there and do 20 job searches to get 96 bucks. Now, if you can find someone who will let you uh, rent you out a room and write you a letter that they're going to give you this room, they'll up it to $250. But in my case, that's been kind of hard to find. But I, I was blessed with uh, a couple who allowed me to stay at their house for, uh, for a little bit of time now. But before that, I did go to the rescue mission and they extended me there for about six weeks. Across the street, they got someone they call the next step until you figure out what something might come your way. But what I'm saying, what I'm leading to is that they do not give you enough money to, to put a deposit and get into a housing maybe at $400 a month. So you, you stay stuck there. So there, there's not enough funding. There's not a certain place where they literally take you off the street and utilize the money that the city gives you. So even though I don't use drugs and I'm not in that line or anything, I'm in the streets because I don't have enough funding to get off the street. So it's, it's, it's that's the where you get stuck at and you end up on the streets going day by day. Yeah, you eat, they give you no food, but you have to find a corner of the state, but they don't have that next step up uh, facility where uh, work with the city and take that money that they do give you and house you somewhere. And unless you make a commitment in a drug program, and you know you have a drug program, I'm mean, a drug problem. You know. Yeah. So that's why I see it's like a catch. Where there's the problem. So they, you end up in the streets. You have no choice because you don't have the deposit to give someone to get in. And you don't, you don't have, you can't accumulate the money unless you stay in the streets and just accumulate that GR. Unless you have a problem, a mental problem, they'll grant it for maybe six months or a year. But you got to stay in the street just to accumulate that money to get in somewhere. I would like so, to that's dangerous. We'd like Yellow Feather to respond to that while the <coughs> man goes to the next person. Before I went to the uh, Cody Blue Garden, there it is. Um, you were at the Next Step program, and the, the Pavarello has two villages, um, the Village of Pope and the Community of Hope. Um, I stayed there, um, and you, all you do to live there is three hours three hours of community work in, on there, and it, it's uh, done in like a cycle. So when your shed gets assigned, you do six, like that week, and then you, you don't do a chore again for another six weeks. But you stay there rent free, and a lot of people do uh, receive some type of income funds, and they do stack their money while they're there. Others don't, <coughs> but you know, uh, there is that option. And then there is the option of the Dakota Eco Garden. Oh yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, we need to um, and because um, in my head while, while he was talking, I was thinking, yeah, because what we what homeless people need is just like three to six months somewhere, just enough time where you don't have to worry about your next meal, you don't have to worry about where you're gonna sleep, just enough time to be able to look, you know, concentrate on other things other than survival, looking for a job, looking for a place, going to school, and that's what you go the. <laughs> I would not be where I am at right now without Eco Garden. Since I was there, I had three jobs, three jobs, and I finished the whole semester of um, the program I'm in now, alcohol and drug abuse counseling. And there, I, it was because I had a stable place where I didn't have to worry about it when I was safe and secure. Drug free and drug free, yes, especially drug free is very important. Um, that's, that's what we need is more of that. 
we definitely need more of that. And not just, it, it, it's different than a shelter because Naomi House, yes, you have to wait in line every day. You don't know if you're get in or not. Um, and there's only 25 beds. And, and, we'll and though, the, though, the, though the, the village is good, and, and these are all great programs, by the way. I don't, I'm not putting them down. Um, and the village is, is awesome too. I wasn't in there, but I know people who went on to get apartments and went on to get jobs. And, um, and um, but that is, you know, it would just be hard for me, I think, being out there because you still have to kind of worry about some meals, right? Brittany, can you, can you describe just a little bit for someone that hasn't heard of Dakota, Dakota Eco Garden? Oh, yes, I would. Um, Miss Nancy Waitlow. Do we want to let like, Used her used her inheritance to buy this house. It's um, Anna, two.
I would first of all like to thank the library and Lisa and your wonderful panel. Uh, I have talked to some of the hope, uh, homeless people the, over on Herndon and Shaw are out there begging all the time. They, say, uh, they, they have a stigma, and I wonder if this is true, because I hear it from a lot of them. They don't want to go to the rescue mission, and they do not want to go to Pavarillo House. I don't know why, but they don't want to deal with that. And if some of you would address that, I would appreciate it. Um, I don't know whether it's brought up. I will address that. Um, I used to, to live out there, and there was a lot of times that I personally, myself, did not want to deal with the Pavarillo. And I lived just a, not even a block away from it. I had my encampment right there. You know, when when you, you're in a situation like that and people, you know, get bullied out there, people get beat up out there, people get taken, you know, their money, their, their belongings, stripped, beat down, taking their clothes off, they're humiliated out there, you know, and they don't want to deal with it, you know, and I don't blame them, you know. Now, so for some people, I, I, I hate to say it, but, you know, I'm going to be as honest as possible, some people are just not cut out for the pop. They, you know, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there since the situation has gotten worse, people have gotten worse also. And then I want to address the positive side of what can be done. I talked to some of the council people about having the example of uh, Art Dyson's development in the village in every district to establish a homeless refuge. Uh, what we need to do though, the answer comes back to me, well, where's the money coming from? I think we need to put a major on the ballot for the people to vote to take care of this issue, and we should have such a village in every district in the city. I would just like to throw it out. Um, I do two recovery groups on Tuesday and Thursday at Kaiser Hospital. They're open to the public. The first one is called Smart Recovery. It's based on rational avoidance behavior therapy. The second one is on Thursday nights, and it's called Life Frame. You can do both of these are available on, um, go to the computer, smartrecovery.org or lifewing.org. Um, some people, the path is not AA. This is an alternative. And I just throw it out. But my question is, how can we connect with people that are on the street and let them know there are, in fact, I was thinking we might even be able to go to the village and have a recovery group weekly. Because I understand very clearly myself, being uh, addicted to alcohol, except I'm now in recovery for seven years, because I've been able to go to meetings every Tuesday and Thursday, I've stayed clean and sober. That's the key for me, and I think it's a key to this recovery thing. It has to be a place where you can go and not be judged. So the question is, how can we connect those two organizations with this community? Build it, they will come. <laughs> no, really, if you bring it to them like that, and I want in on that. <laughs> I will. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a really good idea. I really think it is. And and you know what? Personally, I don't like NA or AA because I feel like it's the it's a lot of dry addicts that are complaining about how hard it is to be sober when it's a lot harder to be high. And so, any alternative. And especially because it's something different. I think that if you started something like that and got a couple people involved, and those people come out of that meeting looking like like they're happy, people might, people will, you know, because a lot of them out there are sick of it, but they just don't know how to get out of it. And a lot of it is also, too, is transportation. I mean, because yes. I'm pretty sure there'd be several people that would love to be involved in something like that that are um, at the Naomi House and you know, familiar with the power of the creek up there. It's just the, you know, location, location, yes. location. That's really, really good. 
So since um, that connection makes me excited for any other connections that can happen when we mingle afterwards, I want to make sure we <coughs> leave time for that. So I'm going to cut off this exciting conversation. I'm going to turn the time back over to Laurel briefly. And then there's, of course, food in the back. Survey, survey, survey. Please fill it out, whatever you do. But let me have Laurel say a few words. Right? Yeah, we got one on one side. Thank you for all of you for all of your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't take them all, uh, but the, the hour is getting a bit late, and we do have some young people in the audience, including me. Um, but I, I want I want to thank you for you guys. Huh? I want to thank you. I admire you. I I am so impressed with your strength and your dignity. And I know it took a lot of courage to do the film, which is one thing, because you're talking to a camera. But that courage was nothing like you have to be up here tonight. And that's the Thank you again for being here.